So, fathers, thank you. Thank you for your commitment, for being here with your families at, at First Baptist Church. And um, it's, it's a wonderful thing. If you would open your Bibles to Luke chapter 15, we're going to pick up where we left off this morning. Not pick up where we left off, but kind of focus on the same passage of Scripture. Hitting some power passages, power verses, and this is one of those passages. It's the passage, the story, the parable of the prodigal son. It's one that most people who've come to church have heard before. I'm entitled the message, The Father is Good, But the Kids Stink. Maybe you know someone like that. The Father is good, but the kids just stink. This is one of those such accounts as we look at this, at this parable that Jesus taught us. Familiar story, a familiar account. One you may not know exactly where, where it was, but you could give a synopsis. If you grew up in Sunday school like I grew up in Sunday school, you probably saw this illustrated on flannel graph. You saw the prodigal son with his, with his different coat of colors and the, and the father as he's, as he's, you know, arm like this running across the flannel graph. You've heard this. Uh, it's not as familiar as David and Goliath, but it, definitely a go-to teachers when you don't have something to teach that morning. You go to the prodigal son and uh, bring that back. I believe there's some lessons for us, though, as we look at this again, this account in Luke chapter 15, starting in verse number 11. As Jesus was teaching... He was teaching the publicans and sinners and the Pharisees were around. We find that at the beginning of the chapter. So he's talking to a group of people who are, who are not saved. And he's trying to give them some lessons here. In verse number 11, and he said, Jesus said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough and to spare? And I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven. And in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe, and put it on him, and put on a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet. And bring hither the fatted calf, and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead, and is alive again. He was lost, and is found, and be they began to be merry. Now, his elder son was in the field. And as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. And he was angry, and would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment, and yet thou never, never gavest me a kid, that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed him for, the, for him the fatted calf. And he said to him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad, for this thy brother was dead and is alive again, and was lost, and is found. Truth is, in this particular parable, there are two sons and a father. This morning we looked at the, the kindness of the father, the reputation of the father, and the restoration by the father. Tonight I'd like to focus on the sons, the lessons, decisions, attitudes, and actions to warn and challenge us. The fact is that you and I are a whole lot more like the sons than they are like the father. If we were to analyze most of our lives and our actions and attitudes, most of us fall inside some of the sons' attitudes and actions rather than the father. 
I'd like to look tonight when the Father's good, but the kids stink. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your grace and strength. I pray you'd help me tonight. Lord, help me to say those things that would challenge and, and correct us by your word. Lord, if there's something that I shouldn't say, maybe though it's even in my, in my notes, that you would, Lord, just move my eyes past it. Lord, help me be guided by your spirit. May we be good listeners. In Jesus' name, amen. When the Father is good, but the kids stink. It was Gandhi that said, I would have been a Christian if it hadn't been for other Christians. Now, we've been to church. You're in church tonight. You're, you're in church on a Sunday night. That means that you know more about church than the vast majority of the world. Yet you come to church, and, and sometimes you meet other Christians at church, and those other Christians, unfortunately, don't always model what Christ should or Christ is like. And if we're not careful in our, in our spirit, in our heart, we become bitter, we become hard, we become hurt by other Christians, by the, if I can in the story, the kids. And it begins in our minds to reflect upon the Father. And we say, well, I'm not going back to church because of fill in the blank. If they had been a better Christian, then I would love God. If they had, if they had treated me differently, then, then I would be, then I would love God as well. And, 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 I, and I'm never going back because of, if I can, the kids. I look at this account and I see some attitudes and actions from the kids that sometimes are replicated and duplicated and propagated in churches. When we should be worrying about what the father's like. I see, first of all, a wayward son who repents. I see a wayward son who repents. The Bible says, and the, the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that fall to me, and he did, divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. I notice, first of all, that there is a wicked, there is a wicked path here. It's wicked. The son comes, and I mentioned this this morning, that inside of studying, there are some that, that would say that this particular practice of asking for an inheritance was normal. It was a normal custom in the Jewish culture. I, I found very little support for that. I found much more support that this young man was way out of line. In current culture, we typically don't get inheritance until someone passes. That's typically what happens, and, and most likely the son was, was way out of line. He demanded what was his, and maybe lawfully, but definitely with wicked intentions. The Bible says it was not very long, not many days after, that he gathered all and went off into a far country. I, I don't believe for a moment that this journey into a far country was a snap decision. I believe there were already some roots and some seeds in his heart, and when he gathered his substance from his father, it was with the plans to now go off and live the life that he wanted to live, to make the decisions that he wanted to make and do the things that he wanted to do and spend the blessings the way he wanted to spend them. Sometimes you'll meet a Christian who takes the blessings of God and decides to spend those blessings the way that they want to spend them to take what God has done in their life, for by grace are you saved, to take that salvation and decide to twist it all in knots and go off and live a life that pleases only themselves and the devil, but not the Father. There's a movement out there right now called the hyper-grace movement. Paul answers that in Romans chapter 6. He says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. You can find that answer real quick. Romans chapter 6, verse number 1. But they go off on this movement and they, and they begin to say, well, the, the biggest deal in your life is the grace of God and God wants to give you a grace hug. Now, I don't know what a grace hug is. If I could get one from God, I would take it. What they mean by that is often that, you know what, I can do whatever I want to do. One time someone was talking to me about this and they said, well, I don't go to church on Wednesday nights because the Holy Spirit leads me to stay home. My wife was there that day. They talked about how the sweet fellowship they had with the Lord when they stay home from church Wednesday nights and the Holy Spirit led them to stay home. Let me just tell you something. If you want to stay home Wednesday night, okay, don't blame the Holy Spirit. Don't blame God Almighty. He wants you to stay home. Just say, I want to stay home. 
Don't wrap it in something else. This young man took the blessings of the father, went his own path, a wicked path, and spent all. I talked briefly about this morning. I did not compare this, these two thoughts, though. You notice that in verse number 13, he gathered all. In verse 14, he spent all. He gathered all and spent all. He left nothing back. He said, I'm going to take everything that the Father gave me that's rightfully mine, that is my stuff and my area. I'm taking it. He took it all. He spent it all. Not only was it wicked, it was wasteful. It was a wasteful life. He spent all. Wasted what the Father had worked for. Wasted what the Father had labored over. Wasted what the Father had invested in. Poor choices, poor friends. He spent all. And the Bible says that one day we will give an account to God about how we've lived this life for Him. The things done in the body, whether they be good or evil. We must all give an account. And you and I all have different talents. You have different talents than I have. I may have some talent. You're like, I wish I had that talent. But, but you, we all have talents. When I look back at the parable of the talents, everyone was judged in that parable how they used their own talents. They could not look at someone else and say, well, I didn't have ten talents, so I couldn't do what they did. That wasn't the question. The question was always, what did you do with what I gave to you? And I fear that some of us Christians are just going to waste, waste, waste the talent that God has given to you. We have a tremendous choir that sings up here. But you're telling me that's all the people in our church that have a talent to sing? We have some tremendous Sunday school teachers, but, but we don't have... You're telling me you, have, you don't have talent? We have, we have tremendous bus workers. You're telling me those are the only people who can drive a bus at First Baptist Church? There's some who are wasting just like the prodigal son. They wasted it all. Wasting what the Father had given had bestowed upon him. Wasted, wasted his substance, and he wasted all of it. The Bible uses this word, riotous living. Riotous living. It means absolutely, absolutely dissolute of all things good and right. In verse number 30, the elder son says that he was living with harlots, prostitutes, the whole time. So he wasted his money. He said, your son absolutely was the most, lived the most horrible lifestyle that one can imagine, Dad. It was riotous living. You know, God has expectations on us, like it or not. You can say, well, it's all about grace. God doesn't care what you do. Well, I would challenge you to read your Bible. Because God does care how we act, how we think, how we talk. God cares about that. He gives us very clear commands and instructions how to model Him. He cares how you answer somebody. Read the Bible. He cares how you live. I, I still can't believe and get my mind around this, but, but alcohol is still being argued for Christians. Christians are arguing why it's okay to drink alcohol. Why this is a good thing. Why it should be acceptable. I'm sorry, read your Bible. I don't have the time to break it all down on a packet right now, but I can tell you clearly from the Bible that Christians should avoid alcohol. They should avoid it. All right, and, and, and we've got churches. We've got, we've got pastors, all right, who drink and say it's okay. Before, you know, years ago, it would, we would have said it was only the Catholics and Lutherans who did this. But now we've got young people coming from Bible college with the same, same thought process. I often think of you, Brother Edwards, when I think about alcohol. Not because you drink alcohol, but because... <laughs> but because Brother Edwards' father, when he got saved, he dumped it all in the sink that night. I think how you've told the testimonies that you've said... You asked your mother, boy, dad must have tied one on last night. I think it's what you said, how you, how, how you say that. I think about Brother Edwards, who would never argue that alcohol would be okay for a Christian. He saw the effects in his home. And I fear that, that when it's all done, we're going to have families who are ruined because that's what this does. Alcohol, what other, what other drink is known to destroy homes? Homes. 
ruin people's careers directly responsible for death. For death. And this is what we're arguing for. It's my Christian right. I can because Jesus loves me, so I can drink. Jesus loves you, so don't. So don't. Riotous living. He came back and he was a mess. He came back and he, was, he, was, he, he, he had lived a riotous life. It was a, a wicked life. It was a wasteful life. But he was repentant. He was a wayward son, but he was repentant. I mentioned this morning when the Bible says, and I stopped, I want to talk about it more tonight. End of verse 14. And he began to be in want. He began to be in want. I mentioned this morning, but I want to unpack this. This is, I believe, the only time in his life up to this point, he had never been in want before. He had lived in his father's house. His father apparently had some wealth because his son was able to go with his half into a far country. So he wasn't just a poor, a poor man. He was obviously, it appears, to be quite a wealthy man, so much so that his elder son could stay home and still have a large business, a large family uh, development here with a fatted calf and servants, and so and half is gone. So his father was, was relatively wealthy, I think the Scripture teaches us that. And this son, I don't believe, had ever wanted before for a meal. He never wanted for compassion and love, never wanted for companionship. And now for the first time in his life, he began to be in want. Christian, it's true. You neglect the Father. And go your own path, and I go my own path. We begin to be in want. And sometimes it is a physical want, sometimes. But far more damaging is the spiritual dryness. The spiritual dryness. You ever notice how sometimes when that happens to a Christian, when they take a path that's not pleasing to the Lord, that they begin to blame God for their want? They begin to try to make a deal with God. God, if, if you really love me, then, then you know, I need this. I need this answer to prayer. Though I'm in a far country, I'm way away from you. I took all I had and I ran away. Lord, I really need a bailout right now. They're saying, Lord, I'm in want right now. And every time you're out of the Father's house, you're in a far country, you will be in want. The problem is he didn't notice he was in want until he was in the pig pen. But he was in want the moment he stepped out down that first step down the, the path to the far country. He just didn't know it yet. And it seems that way sometimes that, that things just keep to be go, going on well. Well, look at that person there. They're not making, it seems like, any right choices. But, but understand something. They're already in want. They just don't realize it yet. They're already wasting. They just don't realize the process. But he came back to his senses. He came back, and I, I will not re-preach the sermon this morning, but he, he knew his father, and he repented. And he came down that path. His father came running out. He, he repented and he was restored. He was restored. Verses 22 through 24, the, the Bible teaches us that the father met him, hugged him, kissed him, threw his arms around his neck, killed, killed a calf, threw on, uh, threw on the dog, and listen, he had a party for this celebration for his son. But remember this, at no point was he never, was he not a son. He was always a son. <laughs> he was always a member of the family. He was never not a son because no matter how far you wander, you're still his child. I am so glad for the power of God in our life. Paul says, by the grace of God, ere go I, or, or I could do anything but by God's grace. But no matter how far we wander, I'm still the child of God. There's the wayward son who repents, but then I see a wicked son who rejects. Verse number 28, they're having a party in the house. This diligent son, this elder son, he's, he's working. He seems to be doing everything that the father wants him to do. He's in the fields. He comes back toward the house and he, he hears this commotion. He hears some kind of ruckus happening. He inquires of a servant, hey, what's going on? And, and the servant says, hey, well, you know what? Your brother is come back. He's safe and sound, and your dad is having a heyday. Your dad is having a party. 
This is tremendous. This is wonderful. And instead of the son rejoicing, he became angry. So angry that he would not walk into the house. He was selfish. He was selfish. What's interesting to me is that the father goes out to him. The father actually came out to both sons. He met the one on the path. He met one outside the house. This is the one outside the house. And he comes out and entreats him. He was selfish that his brother was safe and sound. He was selfish that his brother didn't get what he deserved. That's what he says. He was selfish that he, the, the brother, the elder brother, did not get what he wanted. He was selfish. Now, this happens sometimes, Christian. Someone comes back to First Baptist Church. It was a big deal for them to walk in those back doors. And the elder son pops his ugly head out of First Baptist Church. Oh, sure. Just come back like everything's okay. Well, I'm glad they came back to the house. Amen. And we can have a party about that. We don't need any elder sons running around First Baptist Church. Can I say that again? We don't need any elder sons running around First Baptist Church. I'm glad they come back to First Baptist Church. I'm glad they come back to church. <laughs> Talk to people who have come back, and they said one of the hardest things would come back in those back doors. You now, the truth is, we have a wonderful church. Marvelous church. Majority, 90, I don't know if there's a percentage, but 99% of this church accepts and loves. But it seems like there's always one or two. It's got to make that comment. Oh, and you can fill in the blank. Sometimes they come back to me over the years. They never make me happy. They'll make him happy. It's the elder son. He was so angry, he would not even walk inside. He was mad that his brother disrespected the father while he disrespected him just as much. He said, you know what? Not only was he selfish, he was sanctimonious. He presented perfection. He says this, he goes, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgressed I any time at thy commandment. He said, Dad, there is not a single moment since I was born that I did not do exactly what you asked me to do. There's a Greek word for that. Baloney. <laughs> Look it up. Not a single time did you make a mistake. Not a single time did you not do something your father didn't want. Not a single time did you make a bad decision. But that's what he acts. That's what he says. Father, these years I've served you, and, and lo, I've, I have done everything you've asked. Oh, it's been such a rough life. You can hear him kind of moaning through this, right? And never once have I disappointed you. Now, granted, I'm outside pouting like a little child right now, but never once have I ever done anything that I shouldn't do. He was sanctimonious. He presented perfection, and he pouted about fairness. You can hear what he's saying. This isn't fair. I was perfect, and you never, killed a, you never killed a fatted calf for me. I think that's how he talked, okay? You, you never treated me special, because I did right. You never, you never loved on me. You never threw me a party. Granted, I've not have, had to want for anything my entire life. And then not once have I been without shelter and food, and, and I have a tremendous operation going on here. But, but, but you, never, you never treated me in a way you're treating my, my, your son. He says, your son. Like wives do sometimes. Well, your boys are doing this. Right? That's what he uses. He pulls that line out. Can I submit this? The younger son went physically to a far-off country and the elder son went spiritually to a far off country. He was so far off from the father that they were not on the same continent. The father's response was acceptance, forgiveness, and restoration, and the elder brother's response was rejection and denial. They were not on the same planet in this operation. He was in a, he was in a far off country, spiritually speaking. 
He did not have the heart of the Father at all. He was selfish and sanctimonious. He was reminded. The Father says, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. I picture the Father saying it like this, Son, just remember, you've never left me, and everything you see, it's yours. Like the unspoken question, is it really that bad? You're angry about the one fatted calf, but if you look around here, as far as you can see over there, and as far as you can see over there, it's yours. It's yours. Has life really been that bad to you? Have I really been that unfair to you? He was reminded of the love of his Father. I've taken care of you. I've provided this for you. Look around, son. You're with me. I'm here. You never left me. And everything I, that you see is yours. It's yours. Countless blessings and riches. And he was rebuked. He says in verse 32, the father says, It was meet. It was appropriate. It was necessary that we should make Mary be glad. For this, not my son. For this, thy brother. Remember who you are, son? You got a brother. You can forget about him, you can ignore him, you can hate on him, you can complain about him, but he's still your brother. You're still flesh and blood. This thy brother. He rebukes his elder son. His son has said, your son walked away, and he said, no, your brother came home. Amen. This thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. He's saying, my heart is forgiveness. And this should be your heart too, son. Forgiveness. The truth is, a couple considerations. Our Heavenly Father is so much more patient than we are. We're quick to, to shout about what's fair and what's not fair and, and what someone has reaped in, in their sowing and, and quick to say, well, if they're really right with God, they're going to have to prove it to me. And when I'm fully satisfied in my mind, then they can repent before God. Well, the Heavenly Father is a whole lot more patient than we are. And I'm glad He is because I've been a recipient of that patience before. And I'm thankful for that patience. I'm thankful that God lovingly it works with me and forgives like He does with all of us. He's a whole lot more patient than we are. Second thought is this. Often we focus on the actions of the children instead of the heart of the Father. Often we focus on the actions of the children instead of the heart of the Father. You read this parable, you have to ask, well, which son had the heart of the Father? The answer is, neither of them did. Neither one did. Not the one who stayed home and definitely not the one who ran off. The one who came back knew about the heart of the Father and the one who was home never learned about the heart of the Father. We focus on the actions of the children instead of the heart of the Father. Who should we mimic in this story? The Father. I'm glad for, for the repentance and the restoration, and it's a wonderful story, and I hope if you're far from God, you come back to God. But if you ask me, well, what do you want for us as Christians at First Baptist Church? I want you to mimic the Father. All right, I don't want you to leave home and then have to come back. I want you to stay home. And I want you to offer the compassion and love and reputation and, and the restoration of the Father. Mimic the Father, His forgiveness, His compassion, His patience. The truth is we're usually more like the sons than the Father. The Chinese artist was commissioned to portray the parable of the prodigal son. So he chose the part of the story where the wayward boy returns home after having wasted his resources in reckless living. He depicted the father standing by the gate waiting for his son who could be seen approaching in the distance. When the artist showed the painting to a Christian friend, the man exclaimed, Oh no, you don't have it right at all. The father shouldn't be standing still. He should be eagerly running to meet his son. But no Chinese father would ever consider doing that to one who had been so wayward, answered the other in surprise. Ah, said the Christian, but this parable depicts the heart of God. He is far more loving than even the best of human parents. And lastly, God always rejoices when one comes back to him. And with that, this sermon this morning, with that verse, 
Number seven out of chapter 15. It's before this parable is, is given to us. Jesus says, I say unto you, that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. So I ask you, are you acting more like the father or the kids? Are you patient like the father? Are you compassionate like the father? You have the heart of restoration like the father. I mean at home with your family. Are you like the father? Dads, are you like the father? Or are you like the kids? Mom? Husband, wife, young person, adult, Christian. Are you acting like the father? Or are you just like one of the kids? Lord, I thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth from your word, for your love. Oh Lord, forgive us for those times that we mimic the sons in this story. We miss the message of our Father. I wonder who would say, Pastor Howell, would you pray for me as you spoke? God touched my heart. There's an attribute of the Father that I need to mimic. I've not been. As a Christian, husband, wife, whatever it may be. Say, would you pray for me? I want to mimic the Father. Pray for me tonight. Put your hand up, put it down. Amen, amen. I want to mimic the Father. I need to mimic the Father. God touched my heart tonight. Would you pray for me when you pray for the others? Amen. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you, amen. Amen. Oh, to have a church where we'd mimic the heart of the Father. Lord, I thank you for your word. May we show forth your compassion, your grace, and your forgiveness. In Jesus' name. Amen.